how machine learning is driving insurance rates, driver performance, and smart transit. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet, and joining me is Grady Irie. He is the Vice President of Data Science at Arity. Welcome, Grady. Thank you, Tanya. Nice to be with you today. What does Arity do? Uh, Arity is a technology company founded by Allstate, uh, and we were created to make transportation smarter, safer, and more useful for everyone. Uh, we're really based in two main areas, telematics and analytics. We've been working in the telematics space for nearly a decade and have amassed a huge trove of data that helps us to really understand how, pe how people move and how that relates to risk on the roadways. So your, your goal is to measure risk. How does Arity use machine learning to measure and achieve that goal? So machine learning is just a technique that's used in predictive modeling uh, in, within the Arity platform. So we originate driving data through our telematics capabilities. We relate the driving data to risk through the outcome data, which essentially is whether or not accidents happen and how severe those accidents are. Uh, we use other data sources to, uh, to really understand what is the predictive power of the telematics data itself, uh, but the models use machine learning in order to get smarter as they're exposed to more and more data. How much data do you collect, Grady? Uh, well, to date, we're well over 30 billion miles of data collected, telematics data, but of course there's uh, many other data sources that we use in our modeling process. What are those data sources? Where, where are you collecting this data from? So when um, looking to predict risk, uh, we use telematics data as a source of predictor variables. So you can think of things like um, harsh braking events or speeding events or erratic driving behavior as predictor variables. And what we're trying to predict is the likelihood of an accident or the severity of that accident. So certainly outcome data. The claim data itself is important to the modeling process. Because in many of our use cases, our customers are also using other data to predict losses. Uh, think more traditional things used in auto insurance like um, age or years license or uh, motor vehicle record data like prior accidents or tickets and that sort of thing. We use those things in our modeling process too, so that one that uses a telematics-based predictor can use it with the confidence that they're not double counting for something that they're already using to predict risk. Telematics data comes from vehicle sensors, correct? Uh, that's one source. Uh, we're sort of agnostic to what sort of source the data comes from, as long as it's coming from a vehicle. What I mean by that is there are embedded technologies in cars that will originate telematics data. Uh, whether or not that data is location data or it's from a sensor like an accelerometer or a gyroscope or something like this, it doesn't really matter to us if it's embedded technology that was engineered in the vehicle when manufactured or if it's in a device that plugs into a Vehicle's uh, onboard diagnostic port, or if it's actually software running on a phone, and we have proprietary software that can run in a mobile application and generate a similar uh, data set. To us, it really doesn't matter where it's coming from specifically, as long as it's tuned to feed the algorithms that provide the predictions that we have developed. How are people responding to being tracked through this data collection? Well, in, in all the use cases uh, that we're a part of, programs are voluntary. So whether it's a customer of an insurance company who's opted into a usage-based insurance product, um, or it's somebody who is driving and being a part of a rideshare program, uh, these are voluntary programs that people opt in because they appreciate the value proposition. Uh, the one that's most established really is this usage-based insurance uh, type of offering. Uh, those, those types of programs have been around for the better part of a decade, at least amongst those companies that were early adopters of those programs. Um, and leaving it up to customers to make the choice has resulted in nearly 50% of customers who receive an offer to opt into that program actually opting in. Uh, we find that model works very well. Who all has access to this data? Uh, the data that we're originating, the access is only to us. Uh, and actually to the customer that we're working with as a part of that program. So if somebody opts out of the collection of data, does that count against them? Do, do they get some sort of negative score for not sharing data? 
Well, I guess you could imagine a scenario where if the only people that opt into sharing data are the ones that know themselves to be the safest of drivers, um, and they benefit from that with lower insurance premiums, if there's no change to the overall risk level, you could imagine that the folks that don't opt in could end up paying more of the freight. Uh, but those aren't really prescribed parts of programs, more just the economics of insurance in general. And this is essentially some sort of driving score that you get uh, based on all the data that you collect. And it's similar to, in some ways, like a credit score. Could, so could this prevent somebody from being able to do business because their driving score was very low? Um, I, I guess, so I'll, I'll take the, the comparison to a credit score for an example. Uh, if you go back into the early 90s in the insurance industry, the advent of using credit variables or raw material from a credit report to predict, predict risk was a huge paradigm shift for the insurance industry. Uh, the information is hugely predictive of risk. In fact, after all the years that um, companies were writing insurance when credit raw materials started to be used, it was the most powerful variable that had been found since geography, since garaging address, which was uh, at that point the most powerful variable um, and still is to this day. Um, but credit information is not intuitive to people. They don't really understand how it relates to their driving risk. And so there was a lot of resistance to its use in, in setting insurance rates or predicting losses. Um, but it was so powerful that um, the, the fr frankly, the veracity and the predictive uh, power of the data won out and it's widely used uh, across the United States. There's really only one state that doesn't allow credit to be used on insurance pricing. Driving data is analogous to that in that it is every bit as powerful a predictor of risk and more. So it's actually more powerful than credit. Um, and so I expect a similar thing is going to happen where it's going to become used everywhere to predict insurance losses. Um, but it's also very different from credit in that it's pretty intuitive. Most people actually do believe that their driving behavior relates or uh, correlates uh, with the probability that they're going to have an accident and how severe that accident is. Um, so in that sense, there's probably less of a hill to climb to get to the point where it's used everywhere. Um, another major difference though, and this is kind of an interesting irony, uh, in the space of credit, that information was already out there. So credit data had been produced for another use case for the better part of 100 years by the time it came to being used in insurance risk, whereas telematics data largely didn't exist and it's only being originated now. So that's really the hill we have to climb to mass utilization. How can the data you collect be used to facilitate smart, smart cities and transit? Yeah, uh, so the way we look at it is modeling to predict accidents is only one potential use case for telematics data. Uh, when you sort of take it up a level, what you can see is all it really is about is understanding patterns of movement. Uh, and understanding even at a, a more of a personalized level, what are your needs as an individual and how do you traverse uh, through the areas that you um, uh, traverse to in your day? What modes of transportation do you use and at what times of day do you use them? Um, and those patterns can be aggregated to better understand the movement of people in general throughout city spaces uh, and to model off of to create uh, better throughput. Uh, to create better efficiency, uh, to actually create better economic value within cities. So there's all sorts of possibilities. We just need to get the right groups to come together and work together on them. How are you preparing for an autonomous vehicle future with uh, all the knowledge and data you've collected? So um, one way that we are preparing is that it's already kind of happening around us. We tend to think of an autonomous vehicle future as like a single point in time. Um, and if that's the point we're focused on, I think that point is long into the future. Um, but in fact, autonomous technologies have been um, permeating the fleet slowly over time, and they're already out there. Uh, and I'm not just talking about Teslas either, right? When we think about 
passive and active collision avoidance systems. Maybe active collision avoidance systems are the ones we would more think of as autonomous. Uh, but all of these things to some extent are using advanced machine learning models to better understand how to interact with a driver and how to interact with roadway conditions. Uh, and so we're already seeing the impact of these technologies in the data that we have access to. And as we move forward, we plan to find ways to make it better uh, than it would be in the absence of this data. For example, when you think about the sensors that are used in most autonomous vehicle technologies, they tend to be local area sensors, whether they're LIDAR, or radar, or camera technologies. Uh, they, they sort of span the near horizon. We'll call that the first horizon. Uh, we believe strongly that these technologies and the data science that goes into the operation of these technologies can be improved. Uh, with an understanding of what's going on in the next horizon uh, and what has historically happened in that next horizon. So if you do things like uh, geocode historical accidents or near accidents on the roadways, uh, geocode the behaviors of drivers on those roadways, which is gonna be pretty important when you have autonomous technologies interacting with drivers on the roadway, having that foresight for these technologies of what's going to happen in that next horizon before the, the LIDAR and the radar and the camera tech can see it, we think can be helpful. So what are some of the obstacles that you've encountered in collecting data and even implementing lessons learned? Um, you know, I think for the most part, the companies that can take the best advantage in the near term with the origination of telematics data, uh, they're just not currently constructed to take the best advantage of that data. So as an example, um, if you're an insurance company that's been in business for 50 years uh, and you have a significant book of business and the companies around you are starting to use telematics to improve their loss performance, if you don't do the same thing, you're probably going to get impacted by that. But your business has not been built around using a huge amount of sensor data to predict losses. You tend to order Pre, uh, pre fashioned and pre manufactured reports from other providers and use those in your business processes. Uh, and so you actually have to find somebody that has the technology and the insight into your business to work with to make this really easy for you. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, if you're a company that's been in business for 50 years, you've probably built a fairly significant IT shop with a lot of proprietary software but maybe not set up to easily integrate with a modern technology platform, making API calls at a sub-second level. That's kind of a different situation. Uh, so you, had, you have to find somebody that both understands you, understands your business, what's important to you, what problems you're trying to solve, and has the ability to sort of fill in where your technology leaves off. Well, Grady, I really appreciate your time. And if somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they find, want to find out more about your work or the work that you're doing at Arity, how can they do that? Uh, I would encourage them to follow Arity on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter too. Flea Market Bingo is my handle. Uh, you can follow Arity on LinkedIn, and I'm on LinkedIn as well, though my picture is kind of funny there. My handle is pretty normal. It's just my name, Grady Irie. Thanks again, Grady. And if you guys want to follow me and more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic, or maybe find me on my website at, at, at tanyahall.net. I have all, links to all my social channels there. And if you want to talk with me, you can find me on Twitter at, at tanyahallradio. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching.